morning, everybody. Um, my name is Matthias Liffis uh, from the Australian Research Data Commons. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this morning's webinar on the carpentries in Australia. Um, before I launch right into it, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are today. For me, that is the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, now, today we have uh, three speakers, uh, me, Tracy Teal from the Carpentries and Sean Ross from Macquarie University. Um, we will first cover uh, what exactly the Carpentries are, uh, presented by Tracy. Um, following that, Sean will speak a bit about the Carpentries at Macquarie University and how they've implemented there. And finally, I'd like to cover some of the activities that the ARDC intends to take over the next 12 months to support Carpentries activities across the country. Um, we may have time for questions after each individual speaker, but we will absolutely have time for questions at the end if we um, don't during the course of the webinar. So first, I would like to introduce Tracy Teal. Um, Tracy is the Executive Director of the Carpentries Organisation. Uh, she's based in the US um, and uh, her first start with the Carpentries was to invent data carpentry, I suppose, is why I would say it. Uh, she's still an active maintainer of a lesson while still being the Executive Director. Uh, Tracy, over to you. Okay, thank you so much uh, for having me on this call. I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of this webinar. Um, and all the work that Matthias and others at ARDC have been doing around training and digital skills and uh, supporting the ideas and work of the carpentries. Um, and so I want to take this time just to talk a little bit about um, what the carpentries is and our model around um, scaling the kinds of skills that are important in digital research. So. Most of you on this call uh, don't need to be convinced of this, um, but we now have data and tools to advance progress and address questions um, in science and society. Um, and we talk sometimes about bringing um, compute to data or data to compute, but we really need to focus on bringing people to data. We have these, these tools and this computation, um, but we need more people that have the skills and perspectives uh, to do this work. So the question becomes, how do we scale the number of people who can work with data? And it's not just us on this call asking this question. Um, this is actually a survey of the most useful things that Bioinformatics Resource Australia uh, could do. And this, I believe, was a survey from 2016. I lost my, my footer here. And I use this figure all the time, and it's exciting now to be using it in an Australian context. Um, and so in this survey, more than 50% of researchers were saying that the most important thing that they could do is offer training. Um, and this is one of the very few times in a survey I've seen that someone wants something more than funding. Um, and this was re-emphasized in a report um, with the National Science Foundation in the United States, um, where the current unmet needs in, of uh, principal investigators in biology, uh, the top three on this list can you, see, you can see are around training. So there's such a demand for training um, in the research space. So how do we meet that demand? And so that's what the Carpentries is looking to do. So we are an open global community teaching researchers the skills uh, and perspectives to turn data into knowledge. And we do this through uh, curriculum and our volunteer instructors. Uh, so we collaboratively develop um, openly licensed materials. So we have, if you're familiar with open source, um, we take an open source approach to open education. So we develop all of our content um, online in GitHub. And so uh, these are developed by many people. So we just released a, a lot of our lessons and we had, I believe, over 700 contributors to these lessons. So these are being used and updated constantly uh, by the community of researchers looking to teach and learn these skills. 
And then we have our volunteer instructors. Um, so along with all of these lessons, uh, we train people in how to teach. We focus on teaching them educational pedagogy and effective and inclusive approaches to teaching digital skills. Um, and these instructors teach this content um, in workshops all over the world. So the way that this program works and scales is that it starts with uh, trainers. And these trainers uh, teach an instructor training curriculum and they teach instructor training workshops. So they're teaching these volunteer instructors how to teach. Um, and then these instructors, they go on, they use these lesson materials and they teach workshops. And these workshops are two days, so they're short format, um, active learning, hands-on workshops. So the learners in the workshop really get to practice the skills um, and not just listen to lectures. So they're getting a real opportunity to learn in the classroom. And then these workshops go to learners. And so using this mechanism, we now have uh, more than 2,100 instructors, um, which has taught more than 53,000 learners um, with almost just over 2,100 workshops um, since 2014. And so this is a map of uh, where we've taught workshops over time. And you actually can see um, Australia is one of the places where we've had the most workshops. Um, outside of North America. Um, and that has been a really growing community of people supporting each other um, in teaching and building workshops. And some of the founding of some of the library carpentry um, started in Australia as well, which is reaching the library and information uh, programs. So what's the impact of these workshops? So these workshops, they're just two days. Um, we're teaching the foundational skills to work with software and data. Um, so this is teaching Python or R, um, sometimes version control or command line, um, SQL, data organization. Those are some of the topics you can mix and match to teach. Um, how is it that just after two days of teaching things like these skills that it has any impact um, on the learners? And one of the things that we really focus on is not that people walk away knowing every line of syntax, but that they know what's possible and they have the confidence to continue learning. So one of the things that we really assess uh, pre and post workshop is people's confidence in the ability to use these skills. Um, so this is our results from uh, data carpentry workshops that focus on that data side using programming practices to work with data. Um, and so the green dots are the assessment uh, before the workshop. So that top one is I could write a small program to answer a question in my work. I can search for answers. Um, I um, know that I should use reproducible programming practices. I can overcome a problem, be efficient, know to keep my raw data raw. Um, and so the purple dot is that same question asked again two days after the workshop. So their confidence in the ability to write a program, uh, search for answers, overcome problems, increases as a full point in just two days. And this isn't confidence that just stays just right after the workshop. Um, in our long-term survey, more than six months after a workshop, um, almost 100% of people say that they are more confident now than they were before they took the Carpentries workshop. And they're continuing to use these skills and they're having an impact in their work. Um, so they're improving their overall efficiency, improving ability to analyze data, manage data. Um, and there are a few people that are saying, you know, they're not using, but the majority of respondents are saying that it has an impact in how they work. And importantly, people strongly recommend the workshops to others. Um, and so again, this is that six months, so almost 80% of people who took that workshop have gone on to recommend it to somebody else. Um, so these are all the, the workshop programs and these have been really successful in getting learners um, more practice with these skills, getting them started, changing their working practices over time. Um, but what is really has the big impact is that an institution is not just running a workshop, um, but to build the local capacity for training. So not just that one workshop and then you go away and you never run another one. 
But what institutions are looking to do and that we want to help uh, facilitate is that kind of that pyramid of the trainers and the instructors is to build that at an institution. Um, and so we do that with our membership program. Um, and the membership program includes instructor training, so training people in, at the institution to be those instructors so that they can run local workshops, continue to engage with learners after the, work, um, after the workshop. Um, and importantly, uh, to build a local capacity, um, a local community of practice. Um, so a local community of practice around uh, teaching these skills, so the instructors uh, learn to teach, they uh, share perspectives, they talk about some technology, but then also that community of learners um, that can learn from each other and the instructors. So it can really change, the, start to change at an institution uh, the way that the community thinks about and works with data and code. Um, so this is a little bit of an overview of the membership model, and I think this is something that Matthias wanted me to touch on. Um, so this is this is the mechanisms that we use that around um, coordinated workshops, um, these instructor training, and helping you really build that community at your institution. Um, so we now have more than 80 members um, around the world, um, with a renewal rate at about 85%. So um, even as people start to train instructors, uh, they see the impact and want to train more instructors or p instructors um, do sometimes leave, right? <laughs> their graduate students and their postdocs. Um, and so they go on to other places and that's been a professional development opportunity and they want to provide that to more people. And so again, membership is something that people um, really are recommending and have found has had a, a good and positive impact at their institution. So just to finish off, um, you know, we've highlighted some of the workshops and memberships, but it's a big global community. Um, so it's maintainers and curriculum advisory on the curriculum, uh, community roles, um, discussion hosts, regional coordinators. Uh, so it's really takes a global village um, to, to bring this all together and continue to sustain and grow uh, the community and the program. So just thank you so much um, for having me on this call and I'll take questions uh, whenever Matthias, uh, Matthias uh, opens it up for questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Tracy. Um, yeah, Matush, he's in Europe. I'm Matthias. Um, yes, I know. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do have some time for uh, questions, um, if you have any. There is a, um, in the, uh, sorry, I'll turn my camera on. Um, so in the interface for GoToWebinar, there is a little space where you can type in your questions. Um, I will read them out. Um, uh, no questions for now by the looks of it. So we'll move on. Um, okay, to Sean Ross. Um, Sean Ross is the Director for Data Science and E-Research at Macquarie University. Um, and, oh, hang on, sorry, Ingrid has a question here. Uh, sorry, Tracy and, and Sean, so one question. Um, Ingrid Mason from Arnet asks, Hi, what about less specialist research infrastructure? So I think I might read into Ingrid's question a, a little bit. So um, Ingrid repre represents an organization that um, provides discipline agnostic, major discipline agnostic infrastructure uh, to universities and research organizations such as networks, cloud storage, cloud compute, things like that. Got it, okay, so yes, so um, I mentioned briefly kind of right at the beginning that we have software carpentry, data carpentry, and library carpentry. So those are all sets of lessons uh, with slightly different objectives to them. Uh, so data carpentry is, is kind of domain specific. It's focused on researchers working with particular types of data. Library carpentry uh, is for the library community and information professionals. Uh, and then software carpentry is agnostic. Um, so it's uh, domain agnostic. So it's designed to teach people maybe with some programming experience uh, how to do use better software development practices. So it is focused on uh, Python or R, better practices there. Um, with no no domain perspective, and then it also has version control and command line. Uh, if you're also in the HPC space, there's also an emerging curriculum with an introduction to HPC, so sort of HPC in a day, 
um, that also would again be domain agnostic and would be designed uh, to teach researchers how to use their uh, local HPC resources. Okay, great. Uh, okay, we'll move now to Sean. As I said, Sean Ross is the Director for Data Science and E-Research at Macquarie University. Uh, and Macquarie University has undertaken a fairly significant um, uh, approach and investment in the carpentry. So, Sean, could you please tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Um, so, uh, uh, Macquarie University, um, a few years ago, um, before I took on this role, uh, decided to uh, uh, decided to leave Intersect, our state-based uh, um, uh, e-research organization, and as a result, we needed to pick up uh, um, many things ourselves internally. And the one thing that we have uh, that I think has been a reasonable success is uh, is the training program that we implemented around software carpentry. So. Um, essentially, uh, what we did was, if you recall the um, membership levels, we, we started at a gold level and now we're at a platinum uh, level. Uh, and uh, we began running uh, uh, seminars, though, I'm sorry, workshops. Those have then ramped up to be more, you know, more frequent. We run about, we run not counting ResBAS, which I'll talk about in a minute, but just internal to Macquarie, we run probably eight to 10 workshops of 20 to 40 um, uh, learners each. Uh, we uh, pro we uh, instruct about 250 um, uh, learners uh, each, uh, each year. Um, and now in this, in the last year, we've gone to the platinum membership, which means that we've also uh, begun, um, uh, we've also uh, uh, begun training our or having our own uh, uh, instructor trainers, the trainers um, uh, geared up to uh, uh, so that we can build our pool of, uh, of of instructors here. So we have one trainer now uh, who's already started helping, uh, else, who's also started um, uh, running in, um, running instructor trainer workshops elsewhere, and we'll put in another, uh, we'll do another trainer in the next uh, in the next cycle. So, uh, so Macquarie's essentially gone all in on uh, on on the uh, on software carpentry as the mechanism for our um, you know computational literacy uh, here. So, um, one of the things that I'd say if you compare us to uh, um, you know to um, say to to other uh, uh, places that offer um, software carpentry. Um, what we've really done is try to emphasize the building of community and that uh, the community here. And what that's essentially entailed is that first we found that you know it was really important. It we found it very important to run the sort of normal two-day full uh, carpentry workshops uh, rather than chopping them up uh, as happens you know sometimes into you know do four hours of Git or four hours of shell or you know some Python or some R. We we tend to run the 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 full workshops and at the same time uh, we we charge for them that was partly done to uh, uh, control attrition in that um, before we started charging we had about a 40 percent attrition rate and, and planning was and you know but at the same time we'd have a you know we'd have a wait list with 30 people on it who want to come to the workshop and then we'd have 40 percent of them not show up so we started charging a nominal fee uh, just about enough I have to top it up a little bit but just about enough to cater for the workshops and we found that that combination of two-day workshops and having catering and making it a real event for attendees um, it, it in the feedback we've gotten we've learned that that means a lot to the uh, uh, to the learners who um, uh, who come to the workshops um, so, and that will feed into something I'm going to talk about in just a minute. But before I do that, the other thing I would mention is that we've been trying very hard as well to push this out to all disciplines. So, uh, so I'm a historian and archaeologist. I sit in the Faculty of Arts here, and I'll say we've had a re we it, it has been challenging to get um, uh, researchers, staff in the Faculty of Arts, and I'd say also the faculty of business economics here uh, engaged in carpentries. The vast majority of our uh, of our learners have come from the faculty of science and engineering, faculty of medicine, and to a lesser extent the faculty of human sciences. Um, 
and we've had uh, it. It is. It, it's actually been. Uh, helpful that we push the data carpentry because it sounds less uh, intimidating to uh, uh, to, to um, uh, staff in the in the faculty of arts um, and in the faculty of business and they've and we've had somewhat more success in uh, in, in recruiting them to those to the uh, to data carpentry as opposed to software carpentry. Um, so that that's another thing that we've really um, that we've really tried to do is push it out to all disciplines and make it a, a genuine sort of campus wide um, campus wide initiative. Now, what we're uh, trying to do with the um, uh, with the you know making the workshops more of an you know an event a focus for the people for the learners who attend them is uh, that we're trying to set up we're trying to do two things. First, set up a pipeline um, where we have people come and they're learners. And after they've been learners, we encourage them, you know, come back and do another workshop if you want. If you've done, you know, Python, come back and do the uh, Python and SQL web scraping one or follow on one. Come back, do the intro to, high, uh, to HVC if you need that. Or if you've done data carpentry, come to, uh, uh, come to R. Um, so we encourage them to come to more workshops and then we um, uh, once um, once we have them hooked we encourage them to become helpers and then we uh, nurture the help helpers and, and uh, convince them to as many as we can to become instructors and then from our instructors uh, we recruit trainers and I think we've done a reasonably good job setting up that pipeline from learner to helper to instructor to trainer so um, and then as soon as people move on to being helpers or instruct and especially instructors, we encourage them um, if they're still helpers, we'll have them work with an instructor, encourage them to contribute to lessons, um, you know, uh, so that they or, or do other things to help to keep them uh, part of the community. Um, we um, uh, do joint uh, activities with other unis and get um, uh, you know get our helpers and instructors to help out with those and we're a big uh, supporter of Resbaz Research Bazaar here in Sydney and you know we'll probably you know instructors from uh, Macquarie probably you know train another uh, or are involved with workshops training another you know 150 200 learners or more at Resbaz in addition to the ones that we train internally here oh and I will say we do uh, we do um, offer training to non-Macquarie people at Macquarie kind of either on a space available basis or if outside people contact us um, and uh, ask can we have 10 slots at your next training or something like that we'll we'll often do that as uh, as well um, so the first uh, goal that we have is to establish this pipeline of, uh, of of helpers, uh, learner to helper to instructor to trainer. The other thing we do is try to foster spin-off activities. Um, in the sense, that we uh, software carpentry has been our main vehicle for launching hacky hours, user groups, um, and uh, also we begin we've begun to offer some more spin-off workshops that aren't software carpentry workshops, but that are that came about because the people in the workshops asked for them. And the most recent one of those is um, after some of the data carpentry in our workshops, we had learners who said, you know, this has been really great, but I really need to brush up on my on, on my statistics. Could you do something that's, um, you know, still uses R, but is uh, a little bit more focused on choosing the appropriate statistical approaches and implementing them? And we recently had a workshop uh, uh, on, um, on that. So not a, a formal software carpentry, but something that that spun out, spun out of our uh, software carpentry workshops. So we found it a good vehicle for a lot of uh, for um, developing a, a software carpentry community, and then also for being the launch pad for these spin-off activities. So um, the last couple of things I, I'll mention is uh, as we're going forward, uh, one you know one set of opportunities and one set of challenges that uh, that we have keeping this going. So the biggest opportunity that I think we have is that we've begun to um, uh, integrate software carpentry uh, into our uh, some of our classes at the master's level. Uh, and so Macquarie, does, uh, unlike a lot of Australian universities, doesn't do a three-year bachelor's degree and then a one-year honors. Uh, we're on the European system, uh, so we have a three-year bachelor's degree and then you go on to, a, to an MRES, a master's of research. 
Um, and in two faculties now, in the Faculty of Arts and in the Faculty of Science and Engineering, um, we've integrated uh, data carpentry into uh, the uh, into an IMRES methods class uh, that's either required or one of a couple of, of units that's uh, uh, required of the IMRES students. Um, and um, uh, that's run once in science and engineering in, in uh, specifically in biology, ecology and related disciplines. Uh, and we're uh, that ran last semester and this semester we're running it in um, uh, in arts. And uh, in those cases, we break it up into um, Instead of doing it in two days, we do it like one or two hours a week over six to twelve uh, uh, six to twelve weeks. A little bit more condensed in in science engineering, a little more spread out in arts. Um, but um, we are uh, uh, we really think that this is going to be a, a good way to promote computational thinking and the ability to learn how to learn new new software, new uh, approaches uh, related to technology. So we think that integration into IMRES classes is a real opportunity. Um, and on the other hand, I'd say the biggest challenge we face is uh, running all of this with essentially an all volunteer uh, you know, workforce because it's starting to add up to a lot of hours. And we recognize our um, in helpers and instructors as best we can. Everybody gets a you know, letter from the PBCR and uh, we give them little gifts and we try to make them feel like they're part of a, a community, which of course they're the core of the community really. Um, but uh, this still becomes a workload issue for uh, uh, for a lot of staff and H HDR students uh, who are our volunteers. And as a result, we we do have some retention problems. So far, our new problems. Our new recruitment has uh, been able to um, replace uh, the, the staff who've left or just said they can't do it anymore. Um, but I would like to improve our retention of uh, instructors over the, you know, over the long, long term. So there are some challenges around workload with an all volunteer force. And uh, the, what I'm trying to do is uh, get a certain number of hours recognized officially in our volunteers workloads to rec to uh, uh, compensate them recognize them for uh, what they're doing with software carpentry so uh, that's the rundown of what we do at uh, uh, at Macquarie, I, I just I wanted to give you a, a pretty basic overview to make sure that we had time for uh, uh, for questions so happy to take questions Okay, Sean, some questions did come in while you're speaking. Um, first off, uh, Chris McAvaney from Deakin University just wanted to clarify, was that eight to 10 workshops per year or per month that you run? Oh, a year. Uh, we run them uh, about, uh, it's it's gear, this is a moving target. Uh, we may get closer to 12 this year, but that's per, that's per year. Um, so we train, again, we're on track to probably train, you know, in excess of 250 learners this year uh, and uh, it, you know to give you an idea of that we have about 2000 research like active staff at Macquarie you know plus of course HDR students plus we do open a few slots to um, uh, a, a few slots to external uh, people we were approached by Ansto and we'll probably you know, run a, a training workshop for uh, for some of their staff, for example. Um, but uh, uh, it, you know, we it, that's about the scale of it. And uh, I should say, my team, I'm I'm half time, and I've got two part time project managers, and we're in, uh, you know, we're we're doing a lot, a number of other things aside from software carpentry, and that's probably the institutional uh, role and uh, institutional support for organizing them is probably the bottleneck right now. We're not we're not having any trouble filling the net, you know, sort of any number of uh, workshops that we want to offer. The, uh, I mean, we do, of course, as we offer more, we uh, increase the variety. Uh, but as soon as, you know, R starts to seem like, okay, they're not filling quite as fast, uh, you know, we'll run SQL instead, and then it'll be full again. And then the next year, new HDRs and ECRs, early career researchers come in, and there'll be a new, you know, uh, 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 cohort of uh, potential learners. Uh, so I think we could offer you know, especially if we opened uh, some of them up a little bit more to um, uh, to other unis, I'm I'm sure that we could, and other organizations, I'm sure we could fill even more uh, workshops. 
um, we tend to run them when I say we run 10 8 to 10 we'll we'll run those it will run a couple of them simultaneously so we actually do them a, like two of them for uh, simultaneously four or five times a year because we found the admin we have to really economize on our administrative overhead and it's easier to run you know two seminars at the same time uh, sorry workshops at the same time than it is to uh, you know run one this week and run and another one next week um, so now we'll we've often started doing things like we'll run a data carpentry or an intro to R and then we'll run one at the same time that is a bit smaller and more advanced like the HPC one or the SQL one or we've started to get asked to run more advanced R or um, uh, our Python workshops that focus on visualization or, you know, some other, um, uh, you know, subset of, of the, uh, of, of the activities you can do with the languages. So, um, so yeah, sorry, that was a long answer, but I think it helps give you an idea of what we, what we do here. Cause we are running it really on a shoestring, both in terms of, um, of funding and, uh, and support staff. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Next question is, what do you charge for your courses? Uh, they have considered a small fee, about $10, so that people show up after registering. Yeah, we charge about 20, uh, 25, I think, uh, you know, for for hours for two days. But again, we make it very clear to the, you know, to the, um, uh, to the learners that, you know, what, you know, what they're, what they're, you know, we we charge this to reduce reduce attrition, which made planning really difficult, uh, and we spend essentially all of it on um, uh, uh, on on uh, catering. In fact, I have to I have to top it up a little bit to uh, uh, to cover teas and and lunches. But the fact that everyone sort of has their tea and uh, you know teas and lunches together and are talking to one another, it I can't. It sounds like a little thing, but it, it really makes a difference in the experience that the learners have and their willingness to, um, you know, come back and do another workshop, go on to become helpers. Uh, you know, they they meet people, they make friends. Uh, it, it makes a big difference. But yeah, no one's we've gotten, you know, one or two complaints about the twenty five dollar fee but out of hundreds uh of of uh learners so i i think you know that it's that getting up around the 20 dollar mark is probably what you need to really reduce attrition yep okay great um now we'll probably move along we do have quite a few more questions but i think we'll save those for the end uh and there's a comment 25 dollars is a pretty nominal fee um for two days of training uh okay so um, now it is my turn. Um, oh, sorry. There we go. Uh, so I am a research software skills specialist at the Australian Research Data Commons, um, and I have been uh, working with the ARDC since the beginning of the year. And one of my uh, uh, roles is to look at the carpentries in Australia um, and and see what could be done to support activity around the nation. Um, so I spent some time, um, I spent a few months uh, talking to various people around the country, uh, looking at data, doing some investigation, um, and saw that um, although there is some very healthy levels of carpentries activity uh, in some parts of the country, it's not necessarily universal. Um, now, uh, as a result of that report, uh, which will be made available, um, we will be undertaking some activities uh, to to boost the carpentries. Now, um, what we are very interested in doing um, is partnering with institutions around Australia who would like to host workshops but haven't necessarily had the opportunity to do so uh, so far. Um, we'd like to get some more instructors trained around the country. Um, as uh, Sean said, the um, Having a, a stable of, well, sorry, stable, it's a poor word. Having a, a group of instructors is quite important to maintain, um, and it's not always easy to, to keep them together. Uh, and we'd also like to support the general carpentries community in Australia. Now, uh, when I say more workshops around the country, um, why is that? So, this is a, a little map um, that 
um, of workshops that had taken place around Australia um, over the past seven or eight years or so. Uh, it's not complete, uh, unfortunately. Um, I do know that some workshops took place uh, in Darwin, for example, uh, adjunct, sorry, uh, associated events to conferences and things like that. But as you can see, the uh, real core of activity has been largely Brisbane, uh, Sydney and Melbourne, uh, with a healthy number of workshops in Perth. Um, but then there probably haven't been quite so many workshops taking place elsewhere, uh, especially the regions, but also Darwin, Adelaide and Hobart uh, and Canberra too. So what um, we would like to see is uh, more of these workshops taking place uh, everywhere, um, but it can be a bit of, um, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation, I suppose, where um, some organisations will already have uh, champions internally who can um, lobby for support, uh, financial support especially, to run workshops. Um, but unfortunately, not all organisations are able to do that. So we will assist organisations in hosting workshops. Um, and an example of that is, in fact, next week, uh, the ARDC is partnering with the uh, University of Adelaide, University of South Australia and Flinders University to run a workshop there. Um, and we have uh, arranged for some instructors to come in from um, outside of those universities, um, particularly the CSIRO. Um, and we are running a workshop there as a, a demonstrator of what the potential of these workshops are. Uh, and we're inviting potential champions, potential future instructors to come along, experience the carpentry's methodology um, and see how it could be useful for them. Uh, so these workshops that we would like to help run, um, we definitely want them to uh, gauge what the local demand for carpentry's training is. Uh, and certainly anecdotally, I, um, well, after, after running my interviews earlier this year, Almost every carpentry's workshop that has been scheduled in Australia is booked out very, very, very quickly. Um, so I've heard in some cases, you know, it's two hours after being announced a workshop is fully booked and that space is for 40 people. Um, so I'm not really worried about there being a lack of demand, that's for sure. Um, we would like to identify those local champions uh, for the carpentries. Um, influential researchers, uh, research support professionals who can lobby to get support from other parts of the university. Uh, we would absolutely like to identify potential instructors. Um, it's not always uh, possible to um, uh, rely on the goodwill of volunteers, especially from other organisations who might need to be released from their day-to-day -day duties to assist. Now we do have uh, um, some organisations who are quite happy to assist, but unfortunately um, they're not everywhere in the country. Um, and finally, we are very interested to see collaborations um, within the institutions and between institutions to run ongoing workshops for the benefit of researchers and research support professionals uh, in that area. Now, in order to run ongoing workshops, of course, we would like to see some more instructors around Australia. Uh, so this is a map of um, currently registered uh, instructors, that is, around Australia. Um, and we can see, well, sorry, uh, this map is a little bit out of date because I know that there are approximately three brand new instructors in Adelaide. Um, but again, there are some parts of the country that aren't quite as well covered as, as others. And we would like to um, bring new instructors into the fold, but also support those existing instructors to um, help them be released to run workshops. Um, now, we are absolutely interested in supporting the existing community as well. Um, now, as Tracy said, not everybody in the Carpentries community is an instructor. Um, there is also curriculum that can be developed, uh, lessons to be written or updated. Um, there are people who host workshops without necessarily teaching them. They take care of the logistics of finding and booking a room for a two day workshop that can be incredibly tricky sometimes. Um, and we would also like to bring the community together. Um, so we would 
like to see um, some local events in Australia, similar to the Carpentry Con that takes place uh, every year or every two years. Sorry, Tracy, you might have to correct me on that. Um, so uh, yeah, and uh, help people who might have some kind of curriculum that they would like to develop, bring that into fruition. Uh, okay, so if you are interested um, in working with the ARDC on Carpentries related activities, uh, perhaps you would like to um, host uh, a Carpentries workshop, but you're unsure of where to find instructors, or perhaps you would like to become an instructor, but you're not sure exactly who to talk to within your organisation to get that kind of thing happening, please do get in touch with the ARDC. Uh, we do have uh, ARDC engagement officers for each state. Um, otherwise, there is the um, ARDC contact us page if you are unsure of exactly who your local engagement officer is. Um, or finally, you can email me, and I've just realised I've completely neglected to actually put my own email address on this slide, so that can be emailed out afterwards. Um, now, I think we absolutely have time for some questions. There's probably still about 15 minutes to go. Um, what we might do is go back to um, Ingrid's follow-up question. Uh, that was for you, Tracy. Um, so Ingrid's um, question here, she was uh, very particularly interested in skills on moving data, um, knowing the speed of advanced research networks and how to handle small or many or large data files. Um, yes, an important skill. Uh, so we don't have curriculum uh, focused on that in particular, uh, we do talk about um, sharing data and downloading data, a little bit about um, what kind of places you can you can put data or download data from. Uh, but I wouldn't say that we focus on uh, moving like terabyte amounts of data around in any of our curriculum. Uh, one of the things that that um, Matthias just mentioned around developing curriculum is something that that we're working on too. Um, so we just have started our Carpentries Incubator um, for the development of new lessons uh, using this community approach. Uh, so that could be the type of thing that other people, especially in the HPC space, would be um, interested in developing um, and then would be a resource for you or for others, but it is not currently uh, content that exists. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Um, Sean, uh, Liz Stokes from the Australian Research Data Question, uh, Research Data Question, Research Data Commons, uh, has a question. Um, she's interested in knowing what the rough breakdown between staff and students is in your um, instructor pipeline. Ah, in my in the instructor pipeline. Uh, so talking it through from the beginning, uh, with uh, learners, it is majority um, uh, HDRs and early career re higher degree research students and early career researchers um, into the instructor pipeline. It has tended to be uh, so far a mix of professional staff around the university. So some from the library, some from IT. Um, so, uh, and that's both faculty IT and central IT uh, and um, people like the data scientist for the faculty of arts. Um, you know, and I would say, in fact, that it's probably a bit more of a majority of professional staff who are um, uh, who are instructors. And then the next biggest cohort of instructors are probably postdocs here. Um, and it's actually quite important that we have the professional staff on because that offers more continuity because the postdocs may or may not, you know, sort of stick around, you know, get, you know, stay here. And uh, so it helps us um, uh, um, manage our attrition somewhat. We have a few HDR students and a few other ECRs who are, and I wish we had more uh, ECRs here who were not just postdocs, but continuing uh, staff. Uh, in the uh, who are instructors, and I'd like to get more of them. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, next question 
how do you market your workshops and who are the, the champions um, that promote software carpentry? So the way, what we've done over the years is we, we kind of have a hierarchy that we go down through every time a new workshop comes up. The first people that we contact are everyone who didn't get into previous workshops because uh, we, we, we always have a backlog list. Uh, again, so far, we do not seem to have saturated the market here, even running, you know, eight to 10, edging towards 12 workshops a year. So we contact anyone who was disappointed in the past. Then we send it out to, uh, there are internal Macquarie uh, uh, higher degree research and early career researcher lists. They get it next. And, and we have a, a research training um, website uh, now that the university runs and it gets announced there. So, um, so ECRs, HDRs are next. If it's not full at that point, then we send it out over uh, the faculty mailing, uh, you know, mailing lists. Um, we also try to make regular uh, announcements in the, uh, you know, in the university-wide um, uh, uh, research and research training um, newsletter that goes out. And then sometimes staff will, con will see that, contact us and say, you know, put me on the wait list for the next one, or put me on the list to contact the next one and so for the next one. And so they go on the wait list with uh, others who'd missed it. So, yeah, we go people who have either contacted us with interest or, or uh, missed uh, what weren't able to fit into a previous one, then ECR, HDR, then uh, out to faculty uh, announcement lists. And, uh, you know, then we'll uh, advertise, if we have any slots left at all, we'll advertise to UCID and UNSW, UTS, uh, Wollongong, everyone, you know, everyone else around in the neighborhood here. Okay, great. Thank you, Sean. Um, next question, um, asking Sean, have you tried remote delivery of workshops? Has geography or multi-campus been an issue? But I think Tracy, you could possibly address that too. Um, but Sean? Uh, we haven't tried anything like that yet. Uh, like, you know, delivering them online or whatever. We, um, uh, it, the one thing that we did start at uh, when Research Bazaar was at Macquarie last year and UNSW has continued it this year is offering bursaries for uh, people from out of Sydney for the regional university. We've really been making a push uh, at ResBaz to involve the, re uh, the regional universities. Okay. Tracy? Yeah, so um, the instructor training, we do much of that online. Uh, so, for instance, having trainers in Australia and working in Australian time zones uh, means that they can deliver the instructor training online uh, remotely. Uh, so that works really well. It's still a two-day workshop, um, and we use Zoom and breakout rooms and taking notes to make it all interactive. For workshops, we haven't taught them remotely as often, um, but we have done it in a few cases. Uh, and what we will do is, it's important that at a remote site that there are helpers. Um, so the workshop has instructors, so those are people at the front of the room teaching the workshop, um, but every workshop also has helpers. We try to maintain a five or six to one ratio. Um, so you can have the instructors teaching for instance, here, showing their screen, doing the typing, um, listening to the room, and having the helpers there that can help people when they run into trouble. It also works better if you have a good room set up where the person who's teaching can see the room. So for instance, like in, in this way where I can't see uh, the other people, it's hard as an instructor to, to gauge the pace of the room. Uh, but if you have one of those setups uh, that lets you interact with the room a little bit better, uh, it, it can work, it can work. Uh, just a little more overhead um, to get it set up and you really wanna make sure your internet connection is really stable and those sorts of things. Okay, great, thanks Tracy. Now, uh, next question, possibly for both of you, how we can measure the impact of a workshop? You wanna take uh, that? <laughs> sure, yeah, so um, the the results that I showed, for instance, for that confidence graph um, was from our pre and post workshop survey. So that was aggregated results, um, but we have those results uh, from every workshop. So every we share the survey results with every host. Um, so 
the students would take that and we would give you uh, the results of that survey uh, to see the impact. Um, so far, we haven't done it where we separate out the, the long-term surveys by institute, um, but the next time we do the long-term survey, uh, we are gonna ask that question so that we could potentially get you some information on long-term impact as well. Yeah, and I will just say, we do the before and after surveys religiously, and uh, we, we also do the longitudinal, the longer term uh, surveys. And we, the, the results we get are, uh, are identical to what Tracy showed earlier, so. Okay, great. Now I've actually got a response to the last question about uh, remote delivery of workshops. Um, he says that Jason Bell from Central Queensland University has delivered a few virtual software carpentry workshops, but is planning to prepare a presentation on his experiences. And uh, I'm from the wrong side of the country, but I understand that CQU has a lot of campuses, um, somewhere close to 20. So it can be difficult for one instructor to, to get around or even trying to find helpers at individual campuses. Okay, back to questions. Uh, is there a requirement of instructors to be available to teach at any institution when requested? Uh, probably, possibly one for you, Tracy. So the way that we connect uh, instructors with workshops is that uh, people request workshops, so host requests a workshop, and then we put out a call to the instructors to see who is available to teach. Um, so instructors do like to go teach at other places. Uh, it gives them a chance to visit that location, sometimes just because it's an interesting place or to meet new people. Um, but sometimes also for them, it's a professional development. Oh, I, I'm interested maybe thinking about a postdoc at this location or looking for a job. Um, and so we almost never have trouble getting instructors uh, to go teach somewhere, but we don't require that instructors uh, go travel to teach somewhere some people just can't um, for their job or um, for whatever reasons, but there's usually a pool that are interested in doing that travel. Yep, certainly. And um, I, I'm a, I am actually a software carpentry instructor. Um, and from my personal experience, there is a mailing list for Australia and New Zealand um, where the requests will occasionally go out. We'd like to run a workshop here on these dates. Is anybody available to come and help out with that? Uh, and sometimes travel support is available, but unfortunately most of the times it isn't. Um, but uh, that is one of the areas where the ARDC would like to uh, assist potentially um, if we do want to get workshops happening where there are absolutely no instructors. I do want to say we don't Sorry. ask instructors to cover their own travel. So, <laughs> right, so if you're requesting instructors, you say, you know, I can bring in instructors and you pay for their travel or you say I need local instructors. If you don't have that travel budget, it is more difficult to get uh, instructors. Mm -hmm. So like what Sean's doing, right, they have all the instructors at their institution already. Um, if you're building up a new program, it's great that ARDC um, can help with this because it can help uh, seed new workshops if there isn't as much of a travel budget available. Yeah, sorry, probably a poor choice of words. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just want to make sure it didn't come yeah. across as if we made people pay for their own volunteering. Yeah, of course, of course, sorry. Um, okay, now there is another question. What opportunities are there to become an instructor? So I'm not sure if there is anybody um, present who could um, answer that, um, but certainly um, being a a software a carpentry's instructor is a volunteer thing and um, oftentimes a very personal thing. So um, if you are interested in becoming an instructor, um, I would certainly encourage you to explore the possibilities that are available to you. Can, uh, if can you I, have, oh, sorry. Are you sure? Yep. Oh, I was just going to jump in to say that when we offer instructor training at Macquarie, we always reserve a few slots for non-Macquarie people. It's uh, um, and that is one thing. What when you if you go to platinum level, you negotiate this all with with uh, the carpentries, but um, there's a certain obligation to make your trainers available. A, you know a certain amount of time and that can either be 
uh, like uh, our, our trainer went to Perth to help with the training there a few months ago, but then also when we run training on the Macquarie campus, uh, we'll usually take five slots or something and say this is available to non, you know, to non Macquarie people. Right. Thanks for that, Sean. Uh, now we are getting close to the end of time, two minutes left, uh, and we don't have any more questions. Uh, although Ingrid uh, from Arnett did comment favorably on this incubator exercise that you mentioned, Tracy. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Tracy and Sean for giving up their time. And Tracy, I'm not sure what time it is where you are, but thanks for either getting up early or staying up late, whichever one it is. <laughs> oh, thanks so okay. much for the opportunity. All right, no more questions, just lots of thank yous coming on through. Thank you, everybody.